Jazz, how you doing? I'm doing well. Welcome back, everybody. Yeah, so uh, this is an exciting series that we're doing on Alzheimer's disease. Yes, last week we focused on the medical side of Alzheimer's, really exciting things happening in terms of treatment and prevention, and that the way therapies are progressing so that we're getting to a place where one day those who are diagnosed with Alzheimer's, if they're diagnosed early enough, they may not ever have to experience symptoms. This week, we also have a very exciting episode related to Alzheimer's disease. So this week, yeah. our EAT expert and host, Leslie Beck, MedCan's Director of Food and Nutrition, is exploring a neuroprotective eating pattern called the MIND diet with two of the researchers who actually helped to develop it. Those researchers are Dr. Neelam Agarwal, she's a cognitive neurologist, and Dr. Christy Tangney, a professor of nutrition. And they're both from Chicago's Rush University Medical Center, and they developed this diet. I mean, it's really cool that we have these guests here today. Welcome to Eat, Move, Think. I'm Christopher Shulgin, executive producer. I'm Jasmine Ratch. I'm managing producer. So a bit of explanation. So MIND is an acronym and it's actually a nested acronym, which I always trip on. So I'm going to try this. (laughs) Jazz, you... No, you take it. Feel free to correct my pronunciation. I totally trust that you've got this. MIND stands for the Mediterranean DASH Diet Intervention for Neurodegenerative Delay and DASH in that uh, phrase stands for dietary approach to stop hypertension. So it's like a a clashing of the Mediterranean and the DASH diet. What put the MIND diet on the map was a pair of observational studies published back in 2015 in the journal Alzheimer's and Dementia. Yeah, the study analyzed the eating patterns of 960 adults. They provided each one with a score on just how closely they were able to adhere to the MIND diet and then grouped those people into thirds. And, And what was cool about the grouping so the top third the third that had the highest score of adherence to the mind diet versus the lowest score the top third was equivalent to being 7.5 years younger in age compared to the lowest so the people who ate the best most neuroprotective diet scored in terms of cognitive health as being 7.5 years younger in age than the bottom third in terms of neuroprotective diet pattern that is crazy that something you eat like whatever you eat every day can effectively make you younger make your brain younger no it's remarkable and just while we're like rattling off these studies another study analyzed the diets and cognitive performance of more than 5900 older u.s adults and for them Researchers found that the ones who most closely adhered to either the Mediterranean diet or the MIND diet had a 30 to 35% lower risk of cognitive impairment compared to those who adhered to the diets less closely. That's like a substantial chunk. That's, it's crazy. I love these stats. One more study we're going to mention. Dr. Agarwal and Dr. Tagney are among a group that has just wrapped up a randomized controlled trial designed to establish a causal relationship rather than just an association in whether the MIND diet can help to prevent Alzheimer's disease. And they're they're just uh, analyzing the data. So the results will be out soon, they say. Well, let's throw it to Leslie Beck in conversation with Dr. Christy Tangney and Dr. Neela Magarwal. Hello, everybody. It's a real honor to have joining me today cognitive neurologist Dr. Neelam Agarwal and Dr. Christy Tangney, a clinical nutritionist who co-developed the MIND diet. Both women are co-authors of the seminal studies on the MIND diet that revealed that diet could contribute to lowering the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. So welcome to you both, and thank you so much for your time today. Well, thank you. Thank you. I do want to say uh, uh, here at MedCan, as part of um, clients' annual health assessment, they see a dietitian for half an hour and they get to choose between um, um, basically a menu of topics that they want to learn about. And we we developed them all back in 2018. Anyway, the most popular by far still today is the Mind Diet for Brain Health. So I just wanted to share that with you. Yeah. Wow. That's wonderful. So Christy, let's start with telling our listeners what the MIND diet is. It's not truly a diet in the sense of the word, is it? What does MIND stand for? What is it? MIND actually stands for a Mediterranean diet that's been merged with a DASH diet. And that is, it's a hybrid between two diet patterns that have been associated very well with good cardiovascular health, hypertension, 
and now brain health. And so that combination thereof really reflects some unique foods that come from both of these patterns, plus some unique foods that have been identified to be associated with brain health that are much more specific than either one of those patterns alone. And that's how we came about devising this mind diet pattern. I see. Yeah. And we'll, I'll be excited to learn to tell our listeners more about what those specific foods are. So tell, tell me then, how did the mind diet actually come to be? Uh, Dr. Martha Claire Morris was a pioneer in the field of nutrition and in drawing the connection between brain health and diet. So tell us about her and how the mind diet was born. Yes. Martha Claire was a nutrition epidemiologist and she had been trained by Dr. Walt Willett at Harvard. And as you know, or as many listeners probably also know, the Nurses' Health Study is a very long-term observational study. We call those observational cohorts. And she was very interested in pursuing work here in Chicago about the relationship between diet and brain health. So she came to Chicago to work with Dr. Dennis Evans, who was a famous neurologist and had established and was establishing a cohort here in Chicago known as the Chicago Health and Aging Project. And that out of that grew another cohort study that ultimately was led by one of his mentees, Dr. David Bennett, and that's called the Memory and Aging Project. And so what Martha Claire did was she actually invited me onto her team because I my training was, I had a PhD in nutrition and she and I worked together to look at various nutrients and their role in brain health. And at some point I started thinking about people don't eat nutrients, people eat foods. And some other colleagues of mine had started to talk about this idea of patterns. And the Europeans had recognized that the Mediterranean pattern was a very healthy pattern for heart health for many different outcomes. So we started looking at the Mediterranean pattern and another pattern that was a developed for hypertension known as the dietary approach to stop hypertension, known as DASH. And we looked at both of those to see if those patterns that we could identify in our cohorts was associated with better brain health and less Alzheimer's disease. What we did then is we took these two patterns and then we looked at the latest science that was available either from our studies or from some of our colleagues in the United States and Europe, the strongest evidence that we could find, and could we come up with a more specific plan that was not only a hybrid, but had some unique properties. And in fact, that's what we did. And we named it the MIND diet pattern, and we tested it in the Memory and Aging Project. And what we found was basically history from now, because it occurred in 2015, but What we found is it was highly predictive of cognitive decline, that is, in reducing cognitive decline, as well as being highly predictive of what we call incident AD or incident Alzheimer's disease, meaning new cases of Alzheimer's disease being developed. So this this pattern seemed to protect people from the development of Alzheimer's disease. So Neelam, I'd like to delve a little bit into the research on on the MIND diet. I can remember hearing about the first studies published in 2015 and the excitement they generated, not only in the media, but also in the dietitian community. I I wrote about those MIND diet findings in my Globe and Mail column. And as I mentioned earlier, we now teach the MIND diet to clients who are fascinated by it. So tell us about those early findings and how they changed our understanding of the connection between diet and brain health? Well, I think one of the things, you know, when we, before we even talk about how the diet changed things, let's talk about brain health and how that's changed. Our concept of brain health has changed tremendously over the years. And, you know, when you think about Alzheimer's, we would think about the typical changes in the brain, plaques and tangles and change in volume. 
of your brain and that you couldn't do anything about this. And we've made inroads into looking at how can we prevent Alzheimer's. And so that has really evolved into this discussion of brain health. Bring in the diet component. And now you're looking at, wow, could a diet change the trajectory or what we say the pattern of what could happen as you get older with your thinking? And this is how everything kind of folded in together. And now looking at different, as Dr. Tangy said, patterns, right? Patterns of what we eat. So the research that, you know, we've talked about earlier came from big, big, big studies. Lots of people were being followed over time. We were doing memory testing with them. And the diagnoses of Alzheimer's disease or change in thinking, mild cognitive impairment were made with these. And from that, we were able to look at what are they eating and develop what I thought was terrific. And uh, Dr. Tangy can mention this, the score, this mind diet score. And, you know, as a neurologist and as a physician, we like scores. We like scores because it helps our patients understand where they are. But we really were looking at the score that was developed, you know, a score out of, let's say, 15. And where are you on this pattern with the score? And how do you get better on a score if you change your diet. So I think that's how the research has really moved forward to scores. And if you're in the top third of a score, the middle or the bottom third, how does that predict how you're doing? Yeah. So what you're saying is, is with your study participants, you, you looked at their, their usual diets and scored it based on how closely it matched the mind diet. I think that's terrific. And I think that's something that has really got a lot of traction and it's being used, you know, it's been used uh, quite a bit. And again, very attractive to use for. Yeah, we actually use the Mind Diet score with our clients too. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, so tell us about the findings of these, what you found in this early research. So a couple things just to, to mention, you know, when we were looking at the Mind score and it showed that there was positive correlation. So when you have a good score, it's positively correlated with slower cognitive decline. And again, these are people that have been seen multiple, multiple times over a life course, if you will, starting at the age of 65. And the, one of the things that stood out and really took a lot of attention for us was that the difference in the rates for being in the top of the mind diet score versus the lowest was equivalent to about 7.5 years of age. And that really hit home to a lot of people like, wow, that really means something. And even people who didn't score, you know, at the top, but scored intermediate, they still had, you know, over 30%, 35% risk reduction for developing Alzheimer's. And again, that was the other wow of this. It was, it really was. Yeah, I remember that. So Neelam, I want to talk about the randomized control trial, the mind diet intervention trial that's testing the effect of the mind diet on cognitive decline. Um, this is really exciting. It, we're moving now from an observational study to an actual trial, which can prove causality. Can you tell us a bit about this trial and what it may be able to tell us? Yeah, thank you. And you're right. This trial has completed and we're really at the point where we're looking at the data and what the data can reveal about this intervention. You know, this trial was enrolling persons in two sites in Boston and in Chicago. And we were looking at persons that were not, you know, what we'd say not sick in the sense of having a lot of medical issues, but we're not exercising very well. We're not really having the best diet. And for, we're from the community. And, you know, a lot of people can relate to, well, I should eat better and I should exercise more. But we were looking at folks coming into this trial, older adults, to see if we could give them the ingredients, if you will, with the mind diet, and if we could see with them taking that diet and adhering to that diet, could it impact their thinking? And not only their thinking, could it impact their mood? Could it impact their physical functioning? And, you know, we were very careful in designing this study. This was a study that had many people working on it to give the best important information as possible about what we should do. But essentially, that's what the, the focus of the study was to look at. 
And, you know, it, it was a fascinating study to be on because it was my first study where we were looking at nutrition and actually having people adhere to a nutrition pattern um, of intake to see if it will change basically overall functioning, but really memory. So we're waiting right now to see what this trial is showing. It had many people involved. This was, you know, 600 people. So it's a large study. And it went on for, you know, two and a half, three year intervention, looking at how well people are going to be responding to the diet. And this was something Dr. Tangy was involved with, you know, in the designing also of how we should be looking at this uh, intervention, because it's, it will set the stage for other interventions to show this, if this pattern of intake is adhered to, guess what? This could help you with your own brain functioning over time. And, and, and the participants who were in the mind diet arm of the study, they were compared to people who were just following their usual diet. That's, is that correct? Mm -hmm. And But again, usual in the sense of coaching and, and really getting support to, you know, here are some choices. Here are some things you should consider. Here are some things you should look at. And, and incorporating your diet. So they were also involved with that coaching element. Christy, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify one point. So it was very, many clinical trials have one great difficulty is that, you know, people want to be part of the test arm. And so when we designed this trial, there was another part to it. That is that everyone got the opportunity to get information and tools on how to reduce the caloric intake. And the goal was to lose weight. So one of the things that uh, uh, Milam identified was we were looking at risk factors that put people at a higher risk for poor brain health. And individuals that came in had to be overweight when they first came in. And so you know, regardless of which arm they were assigned, both of them were gonna get dietetic experts helping them figure out how best to maintain portion sizes, to reduce their portion sizes of key foods so that they could achieve weight loss as well. So, and, and I'll tell you why that's so important is because when we design future trials, we don't want people to say, ah, oh, I didn't get into the, the good arm. You know, they're not necessarily going to know that. But when you start educating people on components of the mind diet, the participants know that they're in the active component. So what's very important is that both groups, and there has been some evidence to suggest that weight loss has a positive impact on brain health. So both arms could have a positive effect. We don't know those final results at this point. So we're quite anxious to learn more about that. <laughs> so do you have a sense of when this study might be published? Oh, that's a good question. I can tell you short answer is no, we are actively looking at the data. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of data, right? In any longitudinal study like this, where you're having a longitudinal diet intervention, there's a lot of data coming in from so many different sources. So it's ongoing, it's being looked at, but we we're hoping soon we are. So am I. It'll be exciting. I'll write about it. Okay, so now let's let's talk more specifically about the MIND diet. Christy, you said it's a hybrid of the Mediterranean and the DASH diets, and it includes specific brain-healthy foods that have been gleaned from past studies. So let's talk about the foods in the MIND diet. Can you tell our listeners what are some of the diet's brain-healthy food groups? I would say the first one that comes to mind without reading a list off is green leafy uh, vegetables. So as I mentioned earlier, the really hope, um, we had some earlier evidence when we just looked at green leafies, not the entire MIND diet, and we saw some very strong evidence for its role in protection of brain health. And so green leafies are one. We're talking about spinach, kale, Swiss chard, rapini. Exactly. Zucchini, arugula. Thank you. Interject. Because, you know, I think, OK, let me go on. But thank you for the specifics. Absolutely. Then we're also talking about another category called other vegetables. And that's assuming that 
pre predominantly we're not looking at any kind of fried uh, potatoes or anything like that, but we're looking at almost all other kinds of vegetables are included. And we're striving to have people consume about two servings uh, per day for that. And what about the leafy greens? Uh, the leafy greens, one serving a day. Okay, so you mentioned the that. critical piece is having that one, you've got to have one leafy and at least two other vegetables every day. That's that's for the ideal points for each of those. That is one for each. And how do you define a serving size? Half a cup? Roughly a half a cup, you know, unless you're talking about in green leafies categories, you're talking a full leafy raw, you know, then it's a full cup. Because as you know, as when you cook things down, it's a half a cup when it's cooked. So generally that's what a serving is. So the other big one is berries. Berries, um, the hope is that individuals will consume berries about a half a cup, five times a week. And uh, blueberries, raspberries, blackberries, uh, most of the work that's been done, strawberries, have been done on individual berries. However, we recognize that, that there's a whole field of uh, polyphenols associated with berries that are really effective. I just read another paper, again, of just modifying berry consumption and its impact on brain health. So, but again, this is an entire pattern where we're asking people to pull these things together. The other healthy thing is, as we discussed, is extra virgin olive oil. And the emphasis here is on extra virgin, which is really critical because many salad dressings will talk about having olive oil, but if you really look at it, they don't claim to be extra virgin. And there's a, a unique feature about the extra virgin olive oils, not only in their uh, monounsaturated fat content or the, the very uh, unique fatty acid composition of olive, but also in the polyphenols. And if a um, olive oil is highly refined, many of those polyphenols are removed in the processing. So extra virgin olive oil is very important. So the light olive oil sold in the grocery stores, it, that's been refined and it'll be lacking many of these protective phytochemicals. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, let me just, uh, if you want to have a great resource, Dr. Morris and her daughter published a book about, uh, I guess it's about four years ago now, maybe three years ago. It's called Diet for the Mind. And it has, it's her author, um, her authorship. And in there, she has tons of recipes and a lot of background on this for people who really um, want a, an easy source for some of this information, but more than happy to continue to talk about this. I think the other thing that's really um, important and I, is a carryover from both DASH and Mediterranean is the impact or the um, inclusion of nuts. So nuts about an eighth of cup per day. And again, that doesn't mean you have to eat it every day. You could eat it three times a day and then your portion size would be slightly larger. So about a handful potentially, which is more like a quarter of a cup. And you could say you could have that three times a week. And so most nuts are included that. Walnuts are really an important one. Um, almonds, pistachios, hazelnuts, Many of those nuts are the same ones that were used in the European uh, PREDIMED trial, which was so effective in reducing heart disease. Um, so nuts are a very um, important component. Another important component is the integration of legumes or beans in your diet a very great source of protein and a lot of different cultural groups do a much better job than most um, uh, Caucasians. Uh, I would say that beans is very much part of the Hispanic culture. It's a great addition in the mind diet. And we are really looking for people to consume around a half a cup, at least three times a week. And that's half a cup cooked, you know, so we could be talking about garbanzos, hummus, cannelli beans, um, black beans, uh, pinto beans, any number of those beans in your diet, they contribute tremendous fiber to our diet. And there are some preliminary data that also say directly, these beans are important, not only for heart disease, but also brain health. 
I think one of the things that that our clients find um, almost counterintuitive is that one of the healthy, the brain healthy food groups is red wine. And you can have a glass daily. And many of our clients, really, uh, that seems odd to me. Can you explain that? Well, I have to say that we have struggled with that quite a bit. And in fact, although the original mind diet did have alcohol and particularly red wine, and that is a carryover for some of the great work that's been done with the Mediterranean diet pattern. And in that one, like this one, we are looking at restraint. That is, um, there are good, there's some good evidence that red wine approximately a uh, drink a day, an ounce a day can be protective for brain health. But again, then you know there are other uh, scientific groups that are very hesitant to make any recommendations for any form of alcohol. And so for much of our um, studies, our trials, we actually drop that last component. We, we only use the 14 components. And whether people choose to do that, we, we do track that, but that is not, we track that not as part of the scoring, but uh, because that's personal choice, you know, um, and whether or not, and hopefully the mind diet will, the mind diet trial will answer some of those questions. Because remember with uh, the original design of the pattern, it was based on these cohort studies in which we were looking what people did report. And in our map, as well as in CHAP, we have a very low proportion of individuals who consume any alcohol at all. So that was one of the reasons for the hesitancy in making that recommendation in the trial, because even though we saw some evidence of the mix we could never define it with the data that we had that each individual component was critical. And to err on the side of safety and caution, we decided to drop the alcohol component. And you'll see that in all subsequent trials that we have worked with currently with the MIND diet. I guess one of the things I didn't talk about as a positive thing that I'd like to go back to. And I think that's where the commercial pastries and sweets might be balanced by, and that is whole grains. So I think our food supply is inundated with a lot of refined grains. And to find a bread that's made from whole grains Quite a find. From 100% days. whole grains, you mean. Exactly, yeah. exactly. That's very difficult and probably, as the USDA has been um, asking all individuals to consume whole grains at a level of about three times uh, per day, I mean, we're not near that. And the, re the recommendation here in mind is high too. We're asking people to consume um, more than 28 servings per week. But again, the, the thought is we are substituting for those refined products. And that takes work. And that's one of the great things where our dietitians come in in providing that. You know, you think about the grains that we put in our diets and the noodles and everything, but we've been fortunate. We've seen a very responsive food supply. So there's a lot of new grains out there. I mean, you can get pastas that are made from lentils. We have pastas that are, that are extremely rich in whole grains. The problem has been, in my mind, is identifying them easily. In the States, we use something that it's not prolific on all products, and it's a whole grain stamp. But it's, it's still difficult for the consumer to understand what is the best and how do I eat whole grains. Um, I'm sure you've run into that as well. So you're asking, so the MIND diet basically is recommending that clients eat four servings of whole grains per day. Exactly. Exactly. So the original mind diet, you, you know, when you when you scored participants' diets in the in that twenty in the twenty fifteen research, it seems to me that the portion sizes, the recommend recommended, how many times a week, how many times a day, has changed for some things. Now. Yes, it has. Yeah. Okay. Yes, it has. Yeah, because you remember the original one we talked about in order to getting a. Um, a score of 15, like for example, with leafy greens, we said six plus, that's what we said. 
now, you know, when we actually, um, and I guess that's the difference in a way between targets and goals, you know, for, um, for individuals and the way we score it is different than when we tell people these are the targets. But remember, what we published in our original paper in 2015, that was the experiment, right? And now we're putting it into practice with a group of dietitians who are helping people um, adopt this pattern in, in a living situation as opposed to you know, where we were coming from initially, you know, so that is the big, big issue, I think. And we've had constant conversations about that, particularly about dropping the wine piece. And, and I can tell that historically, um, the wine piece came also out of, uh, I published a paper with Neelam and Martha Clare, because I was so sold on the Mediterranean diet and Predi Med had just come out. And so we had looked at that. And I was also adamant about using a particular tool that, like the mind, would have target amounts. So the many other groups would assign a score of zero or one when they looked at the distribution of the population. And if you were higher than the median, you got a one. If you were lower than the median, and these were sex-specific medians, I didn't believe that. That was, I, I felt like if we wanted really to follow a Mediterranean diet, we should have specific targets. And so this group in Greece uh, developed this tool called um, the Med Diet Score. And it was developed by uh, Dr. Pagiotakis. And we took the CHAP data and we looked at it. And that's when we first found potentially some benefit to the Mediterranean diet. And that's what started us on this journey of looking at these different patterns and how we wanted to maximize the positive things about the Mediterranean diet in our mind diet. You know, and again, it was exploratory at that point. But once we saw the potential benefit based on these cohort analysis, that's what drove us to design the mind diet trial. We said, now we need to test this. And that's, you're absolutely right though, Lid, that those, those nuances are slightly different um, from what the original MIND diet had prescribed. Thank you so much to both of you. Well, that's it for part one. Make sure you join us for part two of this conversation next week. Just to clarify there, Dr. Christy Tangney is discussing the MIND diet intervention to prevent Alzheimer's disease. And so that's the randomized control trial that is uh, just wrapped up. And that aims to establish the causality of the MIND diet. And that's the different study than the 2015 pair of studies. Those were observational studies and those ran in Alzheimer's and dementia. The randomized control trial has just completed and the data are being analyzed. Hopefully we're going to get some more exciting stats from this trial. Yeah, maybe we'll have them back. Yeah, we should. Well, that's it for the first part of our interview with two of the creators of the Mind Diet. The second part will run next week and discusses the mechanisms by which the Mind Diet is thought to benefit brain health. They discuss other studies out there that are examining the interaction of diet and brain health, including the U.S. Pointer Trial. And Dr. Christy Tangney and Dr. Neelam Agarwal provide their tips on how to follow a more neuroprotective eating pattern. Follow Dr. Agarwal on Twitter at Dr. A-D-D-A. That's D-O-C-T-O-R-A-D-D-A. Or you can follow the Rush University Medical Center at Rush Medical. And don't forget to give Leslie Beck a follow as well at Leslie Beck R-D. That's L-E-S-L-I-E-B-E-C-K-R-D. We'll post episode highlights and links you can visit on our website at eatmovethinkpodcast.com. Say hello and send us a tip or a suggestion by emailing us at info at eatmovethinkpodcast.com and follow MedCan on Twitter and Instagram at MedCanLiveWell. Eat Move Think is produced by Ghost Bureau, Jasmine Ratchet, managing producer, social media and strategy supporters from Chantal Gertan, Emily Bozik, and Andrew Imax. I'm executive producer Christopher Shulgin. We will be back soon with a new episode examining the latest in health and wellness. This podcast is intended to provide general information about health and wellness only and is not designed or intended to constitute or be used as a substitute for medical advice, treatment, or diagnosis. You should always talk to your MedCan healthcare provider for individual medical advice, diagnosis, and treatment, including your specific health and wellness needs. This podcast is based on the information available at the time of preparation and is only accurate and current as of that date. 
Source information and recommendations are subject to change based on scientific evidence as it evolves over time. MedCan is not responsible for future changes or updates to the information and recommendations and assumes no obligation to update based on future developments. Reference to or mention of specific treatments or therapies does not constitute or imply a recommendation or endorsement. The links provided within the associated document are to assist the reader with the specific information highlighted. Any third-party links are not endorsed by MedCan.